close your eyes and watch your breath. Feel the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. Notice where you feel it, wherever it's most prominent in the body. Focus your attention there, and then try to keep it there, and try to see what kind of breathing feels best. If long breathing feels good, keep it up. If not, you can change. Make it faster, slower, heavier, lighter, deeper, more shallow. Experiment. Explore with your meditation. These are themes that a John Lee would emphasize again and again. Today we're making merit, dedicating to him. 63 years ago, on April 26th, that he passed away. This is the Sunday closest to that date, so we're taking the opportunity to commemorate his teaching, to commemorate his life. And remember our debt of gratitude to him, because he was part of the forest tradition that revived a lot of the old teachings, brought them to life again, so they can now spread around the world. I was just thinking just now during the ceremony that John Lee would have been pleased to see so many different people, so many different nationalities at the ceremony. He was a very large-hearted person, and he was very inquisitive. And John Fuang, my teacher, who was his student, once said that when John Lee had met me, he would have spent a lot of time picking my brain because of my Western education. He was always wanting to learn new things. He developed a new method of breath meditation based on what he saw of the yogis in India. They were standing out in the sun for long periods of time, lying on beds of nails. He happened to be in India to visit the Buddhist holy spots. And the question occurred to him, how did they do that? He looked into his meditation and he saw that they worked with their breath energy. So he tried it too. And he ended up coming up with a method, not only that we have to practice today, but it saved his life one time. He was in the forest, days away from help, and he had a heart attack. The only thing he had was his breath as his medicine, so he used his breath. The quality that he used, of course, was his truthfulness. Once he made up his mind that the breath was going to be the way, his only way out, he was sincere and devoted to it, remained loyal to it. As he would say again and again, the Buddha's teachings are a matter of the truth. If we want to know the truth, we have to be true, too. Because you think about the, the Ajans in the forest tradition. Many of them came from very poor families, a little bit of education. What advantage did they have? They had their truthfulness. Whatever the Buddha called for, they were willing to do it. And through the power of the truth that we learn the truth, because the Buddha's teachings are not just teachings to memorize, they're teachings to do. And you learn about them, you master them by committing yourself to them and then reflecting on what you've done. This is a theme we see again and again in the John Lee. He keeps comparing meditation to a skill that you, you develop by using your own powers of observation. So your powers of observation have to be true, but in the doing you have to be true as well. That means being sincere in doing it and being really attentive to what you're doing. So when something doesn't come out right, you can figure out, well, what did I do? What did I do wrong? What could I change? As I said, the truth itself is powerful. Compared it to an elephant, when an elephant wiggles his ears, everybody knows the elephant and means business and they go running away. But if a dog or a cat wiggled its ears, it could wiggle its ears all day long, nobody would notice. So it's the power of the truth that brings us to the truth by being true and committing ourselves to the practice, and true observing ourselves, and wanting to learn, being willing to change our, our attitudes when we see that they're not working. This is how we master the truth, and how we know the truth of what the Buddha had to teach.